everyone. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to Crew Talk brought to you by Shoots.Video. I'm Sarah Marintz and I will be your host this evening. And today we are talking about virtual production. So we have Josh, Keith, and Evan here to tell you all about it. And as always, I have my list of questions. And if you have any questions this evening as you're listening, if anything pops into your head, feel free to drop it in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer it during our conversation or maybe a little later. Um, But yeah, feel free to ask or comment on anything you hear today. All right, everyone. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here today. Um, I'm excited to learn all about virtual production. Thank you for having us. Of course, of course. So I guess we should just jump right in if that's okay with all of you. Great for it. Awesome. So other than the most recent buzzword we seem to be hearing, what is virtual production and what can we do to spice things up? So Evan here, I'm going to jump in and answer that one. So virtual production is, um, enables for using filming, uh, traditional filming techniques paired with uh, camera tracking technology that allows you to bring realistic sets and abstract concepts that you would have never really been able to build in the real world um, without going into super massive budgets. It allows for interactive infographics, um, allows for presentation, and also incorporates the, um, the entire spectrum of augmented reality as well. That sounds cool. If anyone else wants to tag on for anything, by the way, feel free to go ahead and yeah, do that. I mean, I mean, Evan kind of covered the basics, but it really, you know, virtual production is anytime you're bringing the, the virtual graphics, the digital graphics into a real live production and you're not just doing things in post, but you're actually compositing it together all at once, basically. Um, so it could be anything to from the weather channel, you know, overlaying uh, the, the weather for your, your city on the green screen while the weatherman's pointing at it, um, all the way up to high-end CGI in Hollywood. Okay. Or it could okay. be as simple as me being here on the Zoom chat with a green screen background without using a green screen. <laughs> So what are some of the most popular software packages used and what can viewers start learning? Um, there's definitely a spectrum of stuff to use these days. Um, the, probably the most popular st- uh, software packages would be like Unreal Game Engine and Unity Game Engine. Um, Notch is definitely getting used, especially in the live entertainment sector. Um, they all have their specific strengths and weaknesses. Uh, for example, Unreal and Unity are both free. Um, so that's obviously very attractive to most people, um, but they take a lot more knowledge and expertise to deliver your final project and to get to that end product. Um, whereas something like Notch that's really more aimed at um, that kind of a project versus a game engine that could be used for a lot of other things like making a full video game. Um, something like Notch can be a lot more straightforward to get to the final final end product, but um, it comes at a much higher price tag. Um, and especially when you start looking at using it with implemented with a media server like D3 or Disguise, you're definitely getting into a much higher budget that may or may not be accessible to people who just want to get their feet wet. Um, some other kind of higher end options are Pixitope and Zero Density, which are basically like... Um, specialized version of Unreal that makes things like camera tracking and calibration um, and keying your talent uh, much more easy to manage. Um, And you don't need all the knowledge necessarily that you would need if you were doing with Unreal straight out of the box. Um, And kind of what I mentioned before, even something like OBS streaming software um, could be used for new users um, to just basically practice keying out talent and inserting them over a background. Um, Obviously it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but for somebody who just wants to play around with green screen, um, something like OBS could definitely be used. Um, And kind of to add to that, you know, everything I just mentioned is really like your final rendering engine, but you're still gonna need to be creating the environments, creating the assets. Um, with traditional content pipelines like Cinema 4D, Blender, Maya, 3D modeling softwares. And so, you know, when when there's still a, a lot of need for traditional content. Um, and I guess, you know, for, for people who want to get involved, most of, most of the softwares I mentioned um, do have a free version or a trial version 
I usually recommend people kind of start learning with whatever they have access to or whatever that excites them and see where it takes them. Um, there's not really like a one size fits all. Um, but the good news is there's tons of new resources, um, just in the, even in the past couple months, a lot of new stuff coming out every day um, for this field. So the, the, the virtual production community is definitely like providing a lot of info for people who want to get involved. Wonderful. Since a lot of us are really home a lot during this time, it's a great opportunity to take advantage of all that free content that's being produced right now. Uh, I know most of us come from the live events industry here. I'm formerly concert touring, large music festivals, large corporate events. So I'd be spending 10 to 12 months a year on a tour bus or in ballrooms or in venues. Now kind of being home just at my computer all day, it's an opportunity to use a lot of these free softwares like Unreal and contact a lot of these other companies and say, what can we make? What content can we create now that we're home on our computers? How can we spice this up? Nice. All right. So in the most basic of setups, what kind of equipment is needed to at least learn and develop virtual scenes? So uh, honestly, first and foremost, it requires a good computer. Uh, that's where most of the initial investment is going to go. A powerful gaming PC is really all you need with a good dedicated GPU. Uh, the better the camera you have, the better your image quality will be. You can do something as simple as a normal little webcam, or you could go up to a full cinema camera and pipe it in with capture cards into your computer. Uh, for backgrounds, you can start as simple as a scrap piece of fabric from Walmart, which I'm actually in front of a $4 piece of green fabric from Walmart right now and a couple cheap lights around me just to get this set up and running where I can actually move around in this virtual space. And all you really need to make that happen is this cheap piece of fabric, a light, a webcam, and a computer. Of course, you can go up and up from there. The more you have, the better it's going to look as long as you always pay attention to the fundamentals. Other than green screen, you can also do large LED wall backdrops. And uh, kind of, we'll talk about that later on in the webinar today of the differences between green screen and LED walls. But you could start low and then work your way up to the bigger and bigger things. But first and foremost, computer, dedicated graphics card, some kind of camera, and a piece of green fabric are the basics to start. Okay. And somebody actually asked as soon as uh, you started speaking, if um, all of you are sitting in front of a green screen and you mentioned you were sitting in front of um, the paper, but Evan and Keith, are you also sitting in front of green screens? No, I do not have a green screen set up at my house. I'm just using the Zoom chat virtual background. Um, okay. We, uh, yeah, we had originally planned to do this uh, in our studio with a bigger green screen setup where we'd all be in one scene together. Um, but, uh, due to, uh, COVID and other complications, we're all at home today. So, okay. <laughs> Sadly, I may have been exposed two weeks ago. No symptoms. I'm all good, but just to keep everybody safe, we decided to stay home for a couple of weeks. Okay. That was a cool, uh, when you just showed, when you panned around, that was really cool. A little <laughs> and this is what you can do out. with a cheap $4 piece of fabric from Walmart. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so virtual set versus augmented reality. What is the difference? So for a virtual set, really the things you need are a green screen or LED and everything in the environment around you is computer generated. Augmented reality can be just a standard camera shot in a real physical environment with interactive elements or scenic elements that align with the real world. Uh, usually a lot of camera alignment, camera tracking is needed, but it's things that you could just augment, your, pardon the term, augment the actual reality with any kind of computer generated element you need. Now, of course you can combine the two for mixed reality uh, kind of the buzzword that's been going around is extended reality, which kind of encompasses all the different things that one could do with all this stuff. But basically, virtual set is the set itself is entirely com uh, computer generated. Augmented reality is just a couple elements are computer generated. And those things that are computer generated could be set pieces. They could be 3D elements that a uh, talent would actually interact with. And they could also be graphs and charts and data that you actually populate in real time. That's very interesting. The, the, the way that I like to phrase it is uh, um, VR is an entirely virtual environment. AR is the physical environment layered with graphics. Mixed reality is taking a person and kind of bringing them into a virtual world where they can interact through the lens of the camera. And extended reality is the bucket that we've decided to just put all of the things in and kind of the future things in because who needs more two letter R words to <laughs> making this more and more complicated. So XR is kind of the extended reality, the future of things moving. Extra reality. So can you give me some examples of places where I may have seen virtual production in use? 
Absolutely. Uh, Josh, we actually got some slides that uh, we can show you guys. So um, the big one that's the real pusher, uh, the big uh, a big push in the industry is going to be the Mandalorian. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? It kind of cut out. Oh, uh, the Mandalorian. Oh, yes. Okay. On Disney Plus. So uh, their team has really been a huge uh, driving force in the use of LED screen for virtual production. You see in some of these pictures here. Um, their talent is actually in what they what, what's called a, a, a LED cave. The uh, kind of volume, of, I believe they call it. The volume, yes. Um, which, which is LED screens, uh, 2.6 mil absent uh, black pearl, or I believe it's the row, actually row black pearl panels um, in almost full 360 degrees, and then a ceiling of LED panel on top. Um, and they're actually able to, uh, they're able to use the, use the perspective of the ang shooting angle of the camera to drive the environments in the background, as well as having the entire environment actually light their talent. So as you see from some of these pictures, they don't have a ton of lighting in the space because they're essentially in that environment. Okay. Some other things that you may have seen it uh, uh, in the past, Minority Report, kind of going back a little bit, they used it um, as well as an Oblivion using projector screens rather than LED. Um, uh, but some other cases where you'd see have, have seen augmented reality. Um, the big one is the Weather Channel. Um, uh, they worked with Pixitope to launch this new version of their channel, which allows them to do not only the traditional things that they used to, but also what they call destructive environments, where they're able to take the entire studio and actually uh, put it through uh, similar weather conditions. Um, I've seen that. It's wild. So last year, as we were all preparing for the hurricane and whatnot, um, it, it looks like the house and where they are, they're standing there. It's being unfortunately destroyed by a hurricane. And what's happening, it's like, that's crazy. That's yeah. Awesome. Driven by Unreal Engine and Pixitope, um, wow. which are these, ver you know, which allows them to really, you know, one, recreate that entire environment, but also uh, build it out using real-time generative uh, um, uh, calls for information, allowing them to, you know, drive these studios to do really incredible things and uh, really demonstrate, a big part of it is being able to demonstrate in, in proper scale um, what these disasters look like. And that's one of the big values of augmented reality is that you actually have things um, in scale with the people that are, that you're, that are in there. Wow. Uh, another, yeah, another and another great um, uh, version of augmented reality is uh, also done with Pixitope is um, uh, the the Super Bowl. If you watch the uh, the Super Bowl last year as well as the halftime show, um, that was all driven. Yeah, the uh, the memorial halftime show that was the uh, uh, Hall of Fame, um, the 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 all time team or the hundred year team Hall of Fame team or something like that. Uh, all of that was driven and created within Pixitope. Um, you know, and so like what you're seeing on the screen, you know, that's being shot through the real camera live and those graphics are being inserted and they can actually move to different cameras and the graphics will still just be floating there, like almost like a holographic effect to the viewer. Yeah, and if John, go back to the previous picture, one of the, one of the elements of it that really uh, helps blur that line between um, you know, the physical and the physical and where, where, that, where that, uh, that crossover happens is, you see, if you look down on the actual field, the numbers and the field are manipulated as well. And they do that by creating a model of the space and overlaying that directly into um, the real world to track to the exact same positioning. So when they manipulate the initial model or put, uh, uh, put certain uh, textural animations on the initial model um, and display it through this technology, it actually looks like the field itself is coming apart and greens are coming up and out of the ground and um, actually cast that lighting and cast those shadows. Um, I think that is so cool. <laughs> another great example. Um, last year, I know the NFL did a flyover at a Baltimore Ravens game where a giant Raven, digital Raven, flew over the crowd. And of course, the people at the game don't see it unless they look at the big screen. But everybody who's watching at home sees this virtual Raven fly over the stadium. Um, also, I don't know if any of you have seen the advertisements for the upcoming Major League Baseball season. Um, but they're uh, they're showing off their new fan system that's going to have virtual fans in the empty stadiums. Um, the fans can do the wave and they can 
change out the the jerseys and stuff like that. And all of those fans are virtual, virtually inserted into the scene using Pixitope as well. And we're not, uh, the, we're the, not only limited to sports broadcasts in that large scale broadcast environment. This stuff is also being implemented in before in pre pandemic times. We actually had these live concerts. Uh, specifically, one of the K-pop groups, BTS, was heavily utilizing augmented reality and digital projection within their live show. So you're, uh, as the audience, you'd be watching the show, but then you look up at the IMAG screens and you see these elements that the performers are actually interacting with and moving around with. So it, it all happens in real time. It can be done on the spot right there and increase the experience for both an audience at home and an audience physically there in the stands. So you have to be moving fast if you're that person there at the concert who's <laughs> doing all, all of the, uh, the graphics and everything like that. And it's a sensory uh, overload to be sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so what are some ways in which you see this technology becoming more widely adopted and available? Um, definitely in the corporate space, meetings, conferences, conventions, all shifting to virtual format for the somewhat foreseeable future. Let's hope not too long because as much as we love it, obviously we want to get back to uh, to doing events in person and being able to see people in person. But um, CES just announced they're not doing their show in Vegas this year. Um, they're going to do a fully virtual format. Um, the virtual concerts and festivals are becoming incredibly popular. You know, obviously things like Coachella, they've been doing live streaming for years now, but now they're taking it to the next level and you experience the full festival um, over, you know, digitally. Um, Tomorrowland just did a big event this last week. They're based in Europe. They had, I think, six stages and over a million paid viewers. So that's like really setting the bar for um, for live music events in terms of monetization um, as well as viewers. Um, their their production was very high level. It, you know, if you watched it, it almost felt like you were watching a stream from from the real thing. Um, they had a virtual crowd, they had pyro, they had crowd cheering when the music was getting exciting, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I think as the economic impact and societal impacts of the current pandemic continue, you know, we'll only see these platforms continue to expand. Um, additionally, I think the education sector is going to receive a huge boost from virtual production techniques. Um, augmented reality graphics can already play a huge part in, um, in some, especially in medical training. Um, but I can see them that expanding into things like chemistry, math, biology, everyday classes in grade school, elementary school, high school. Um, you know, you can imagine like using your, your TI-84 graphing calculator from, from seventh grade, using that in, in 3D and, you know, punching in the numbers and seeing the graph all around you could really expand the way people learn. Um, you know, another example that came to mind was like dissecting a digital frog. Um, you don't actually have to kill the frog anymore, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> some, yeah. some people's favorite day of class and other no. people's least favorite day of <laughs> class. Um, you know, I think another great example would be a history professor walking through, you know, an actual historically accurate model or environment um, of, of maybe a place that doesn't exist anymore um, that has been recreated by, by artists and being able to give their history lesson in the, the space that they're talking about. Um, so, you know, you can really like take, take your field trips back in time. That might be one way that I would want to go back to school. That may be like the only thing that would make me want to actually go back to school is something like that. <laughs> Luckily, you don't have to go back in school to get those kinds of experiences. There's already oh. VR apps that mm -hmm. allow you to do that kind of thing, too. But, yeah. yeah, I think that that would make I think for a lot of people, it would make school a lot more interesting. You know, some people are just such visual learners and staring at a textbook full of math all day is just not for most people, I think. Right. But if you're seeing things happening in a 3D space around you, I think especially the current generation of kids growing up today who are used to playing with their iPads and iPhones at a very young age, you know, they're going to be bored to death when they get to school and they get a textbook thrown in front of them. So I think, you know, finding unique ways to integrate graphics um, could really keep people engaged and create more of an interactive experience too. I absolutely agree. So can you discuss the pros and cons of and differences between green screenshots and LED wall virtual production? Absolutely. Um, so green screen, um, 
uh, one of the main things with green screening, and you guys have probably all seen um, some of the pictures from uh, um, uh, uh, oh, uh, Game of Thrones of the woman petting the green headed thing that replet that gets replaced with the dragon and um basically you have to plan out things a lot differently including um eye line talent interactivity um or you, you kind of get the weatherman effect of like if you look over here in, in in tulsa as they point to the wrong city um a, a lot of that goes away with the led um because you have both the talent the director um everyone involved in the shoot can see the entire environment um, in real time, especially when you're using uh, uh, versions of like a stage we're showing right now where you actually have an LED floor as well. Um, talent, you can um, actually, if you go to, can you, uh, Josh, do you mind going to the uh, the slide three, I think it is? There's the floor. Yeah. The floor, yeah, it might be three, or, or the, the, the Katy Perry one. Yeah, that one. So a lot of people probably saw this. Was this was the Katy Perry music video that she put out uh, like right near the beginning of the pandemic with? Um, it debuted on American Idol or something like that. So this is a great example of extended reality production where they use an entire green screen. So if you look at this little diagram um, and then you watch this video, you can kind of see it. They use, use, an, use an LED wall, not a green screen. Yeah, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, you can see where the edges of the LED wall are, and you can for her as the talent. Throughout this shoot, she had to stand in very specific places. Rather than having to have them pre-choreographed, marked on the ground, um, and really go through the, the entire show a bunch of times to make sure she got it perfectly, um, you know, they said stand on the cloud when the world, when the room breaks away. And she just physically looks down and steps onto the cloud. Um, it makes things like that a lot easier for production. And this one actually used augmented reality as well, where they were able to track some of her positioning. So things were actually able to somewhat work within within a scope as well. Um, and the other really big part about using the um, the LED wall, Keith will go into um, about how it, it, it creates the environment. Yeah, the, the the with LED, the talent can interact much more naturally with their environment because they can see what's around them in real time, um, and that just makes it much easier for untrained talent. Like, you know, if you have a corporate executive doing a product demo, um, you know, they're not trained on how to act on a green screen. That's not their expertise, right? So putting them in front of a green screen is just asking for something weird to happen. Um, and when you have them in front of an LED wall, they can look and see exactly what they're working with or point at the product, um, you know, point, point at the, the exact part of the product that they want to talk about. Um, there's really just no guessing about what to look at or, or where you're, what you're seeing. Um, and another huge advantage for cinematographers using LED is getting all those juicy reflections and lighting off of your talent. So, you know, if you have your, your heroes like looking off into the sunset, wearing sunglasses, you, you actually can get the reflection of the sun off of his sunglasses and you don't have to go into post-production and ask your compositors to try to fake the reflections that you should be seeing you actually get those reflections because there's physically light being cast by the LED volume. And, it, and the director gets that in real time. You can actually be looking through the preview monitor and say, you know what, I need the sun a little bit brighter. Um, if you look at the animation kind of playing in Keith's background, that's actually an environment that he created where he created the volumetric clouds. So say the director says, you know what, I want it more cloudy um, or, or less cloudy, I want it brighter in his face. Um, really easy to make those kind of adjustments on the fly. Um, yeah, you can, and you can, you know, that's an advantage of doing this over shooting on location is that you can make adjustments to your environment and the real world weather, which you can obviously never do in, in reality, you know, where like some studios have to plan their shoots, you know, so far in advance and just hope that they get the right weather for that day. Or they have to book a bunch of extra time on location on the other side of the planet with a whole camera crew just to hope that they get the right weather in, you know, this X amount of days or whatever that they have to shoot. Um, you know, that's a thing of the past. Now you can sh go from day to night to rainy to sunny with, you know, a few clicks of a button if you have the, the scene programmed correctly. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the Mandalorian, if you guys are, you know, have seen that, that's a great example of the reflections. If you pay attention to the, the helmet that the, the hero wears, all those reflections, they're all real time. It's all happening in camera and 
if you tried to shoot that in front of a green screen and then asked your compositing team to go back and edit all the correct reflections in, I mean, that's, that's just a nightmare for the compositors and you're adding a ton of overhead to the, the final product, you know? One of, one of the best ways to say it is, um, you know, you, get, you have to do a lot, a bit more work in pre-production. If anything, most of the work now is in pre-production opposed to sticking it all in post. Um, but this type of technology is going to allow for um, more indie level studios to be producing actual full Hollywood quality um, productions at a third, if not a fifth, if not a hundredth of the cost. Um, just being that you can really have those dynamic differences and um, the, the gaming engines and the, the, the assets that are available out there, you can really develop incredibly high quality scenes um, at just, you know, you don't, you don't need to build an entire world out of physical props. You just, you just build them in. Yeah, you, you don't need to fly a whole team to Egypt to shoot in the desert, you know, um, that being said, there are a lot of challenges with LED walls. Um, if your hardware hardware doesn't have gen locking, um, you'll inevitably end up with scan lines in your shot, which is like, it's the same thing where like, if you point your cell phone and try to take a video of your TV, especially like back in the day, it was a very big problem where anytime you try to take a photograph of a TV, you see the lines going across it, right? That's still a problem um, if you don't have gen lock and gen lock will make sure that your camera and your graphics are both at the exact same frame rate. So every single time the shutter's clicking, the new frame is popping up and that that's really necessary to shoot in front of LED. Um, so there's a lot of situations where green screen still kind of holds an advantage for technical reasons. I'd say also one of the bigger advantages to green screen stuff is one, the upfront cost. Say if you do have that budget for VFX artists, we have a smaller VFX niche team that can handle that work. Totally great to have that later online. Also say you have something that you think you want to change a little bit in the scenic, you want to change a little bit in the lighting, you want to change something down the line. You could, of course, go into your uh, compositing software, edit the virtual world on a green screen, whereas everything in LED is captured in camera. So you can't go, if you want to change something, you have to go reshoot it, just like you would with a normal production workflow. Yeah, with green screen productions, we usually suggest to, to, to film both the green screen and the virtual. Um, production kind of uh, uh, captures, um, so that way you can kind of go back and do things in post. Okay, that was very good information. And so now I would like to talk about relating virtual production to more traditional roles on a film set. So if we, uh, if you guys could talk about um, like scenic design and set carpentry as it relates to virtual production. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, now we have virtual world versus building a real set, your scenic designer and carpentry are now kind of replaced or augmented by, um, you know, a 3D modeler um, and uh, texture art and lighting artists who are gonna create your virtual environment. Um, the set painting is, is, is painting your digital models. Um, and, you know, as, as I kind of mentioned a few minutes ago that now you have the almost limitless ability to modify your props your environment, your weather on the fly, and that's just something you can't do on location. Um, that being said, the, in my opinion, the best productions integrate both real scenic elements in the foreground, um, actual set pieces with similar digital elements in the virtual background. And that creates that cohesive look where it becomes incredibly difficult for the viewer to tell what's real and what's fake. Um, and like the weather channel examples are a great, great example of that, where they are shooting in a real studio. And as the lightning flashes, they actually switch out the real studio, parts of the real studio for the virtual recreation of the studio. And it's, it looks so similar that you would never guess. If you go back and watch it slow motion, you know, you can, and you know what to look for, you can see it, but good, good set and scenic design means integrating both, the real, the real props and the virtual props. Um, you know, I've seen some good shots coming out of the virtual production scene lately where they have a real car in front of their LED wall and the, you know, the car is not moving, but the graphics on the LED wall are flying by them. So it looks like the car is moving and they're getting all those reflections in the glass. Um, so there's a lot to think about with, with the way you build your, your set design and your props, not only virtually, but also, 
in, you know, in, in the real world to shoot in camera and how they're going to work together to best integrate with each other and complement each other. Can you talk about um, lighting in virtual production and the role of the gaffer in digital space? Sure. So uh, just like before, the role of the gaffer is to light the talent and light the set. But now instead of placing a bunch of lights around physical environments, it's digital lights within the scenic space, in the virtual world. Uh, you do have to always make sure that the talent is one, properly lit for exposure, but also lit to match the environment. Whether you're LED or green screen, you want to make sure that your talent always looks like they belong in that space. So if it's green screen, it's a matter of setting up your normal lighting system just as you normally would on your talent, uh, color correcting everything the way you want, color balancing, lighting any moods and tones, or even atmospherics and front lens if you want, but then as well as giving a nice even key on the green screen itself so it's easier to key out in post. And you're doing on LED, there's a lot of different ways you could do it. You could do it from traditional lighting standpoints of uh, lighting your talent so they look like they're color matched to the set itself, or you could actually take elements of the video from the virtual world and map those to either high power video tiles or uh, RGB controlled lighting units so that your color temperatures and your color tones automatically match your real world space. Whenever you move the virtual set around, it constantly aligns. Uh, one of the cool things I know Keith and uh, Evan had mentioned it before was about the weather and the environment. So a lot of the times uh, your gaffer and your grip team on set would have to work with the sun if it's an exterior shot and control any lighting, modify any lighting coming from the sun or coming through windows if it's interior. Now you say like, if the sun's not in the right spot for the set, you could literally go in the software and spin the sky and make sure the sun is exactly where you want it to be and it matches the orientation of your physical lights. And a lot of productions are giving those controls to the, the directors just on a touch screen and they can just, you know, sun over here, nighttime, whatever, you know, increase stars, et cetera. So. It kind of reminds me a lot of that Truman Show thing at the end of the movie when they're like, hey, let's make it nighttime. Okay, sure. Slide a slider across, all of a sudden it's nighttime, no problem. Uh, it's pretty cool, pretty futuristic, but it's what can actively be done now. Uh, also with those things, it's a lot easier now for continuity of lighting on set. Since you're no longer run, uh, running against golden hour or blue hour, you're no longer chasing the sun or any environmental lighting, you have constant control. It's much easier if you gotta do multiple takes or your timing doesn't work out to exactly as planned. It's a little easier to control that stuff. And there are also some systems out there, uh, such as Disguise and a few others, that kind of allow that digital world to be mapped to lighting for a little bit easier control. So you don't actually need a full lighting programmer on site every, for every little thing. You kind of map video to it and light your talent using video. Okay, what about camera possibilities and things to look out for? So um, there's kind of a range. If you start kind of at the, the simplest or, or uh, point of entry, um, it's gonna be using 2D planes inside of virtual sets. So similar to what Josh is doing right now where he is a 2D plane that's being placed into that 3D world. And then you can actually do 3D camera movements within that world. And as long as you don't go too far to one side or to the other, um, and Josh starts to lose a little bit of weight. Um, <laughs> Which is always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, you can keep them in still mapped in within that world. And then the next step up from there is actually tracking the movement of the camera. So, um, the entry level version of doing it just within, um, you know, the basic unreal is going to be using something like a vibe tracker, um, where in this, in this actually, in this shot right here, um, we have a, a camera set up that's our plane. Um, that's capturing our talent. And then we actually added, had a Vive tracker controller or Vive controller um, in a little mini jib rig so that we could move the tracker around and it acted as our virtual camera. Actually, do you want to jump to, the, to that DJ um, video real quick and see if we um, see if that, that plays smoothly? This was the setup. We actually had virtual lights controlled within that same environment. Um, so we had our DJ on our green screen and that's what it looks like in the virtual world. Um, and we're able to fly the camera around within that world. And as long as we don't go too far one side or the other of the DJ, we can still fly all around, light him how we want to light him. Um, and this is at this shot right here is actually us uh, 
you know, moving the Vive tracker around, getting a little bit more of that live camera feel of a person's hand on it. So not, not necessarily a pre-programmed animation fly through. Um, so that kind of um, shows a little bit of the difference. Um, and then you can go all the way up to things like Stipe or Mosis where you're tracking everything from the positioning of the camera to the lens uh, shift and focus, zoom, and um, every part of the of the camera lens is actually and, and location is actually tracked and piped into um, either Unreal Engine, Pixitope, Zero Density, any any of those types of software, um, and you can uh, you can get much more dynamic moving shots that um, have the talents you know being able, the actual camera being able to fly all the way around the talent and keeping them entirely and, and, and shifting focus and zoom levels while still keeping that integration between the talent and the real world, as well as the, the virtual camera shot, keeping that the same. So you don't wind up with something weird where the, the talent's in focus, but so is something way back there, you know? Um, so yeah, that, awesome. that full integration is really the final step. That looks really cool. The video how you to see him in front of the green screen, but then what it looks like when it's, you know, with all the lights and everything, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Are there any special items that previously could not have been done, like ways to make the environment or set interactive? Um, it's, it's always growing. Um, you know, kind of the traditional stuff you think about is like overlays, lower thirds, um, static 2D backgrounds, you know, small infographics, stuff like that, um, you know, stuff that pops up on the news channel or whatever. But now with the camera tracking and talent tracking, you can really turn those kind of flat graphics into or graphs or whatever kind of data you're plugging in. You can turn them into 3D elements that you can actually truly interact with. Uh, you can move around, you can you know, reference in a much more natural way. And the viewer will perceive the space with more like true depth um, because of the way the camera can move around something and you get that actual parallax movement. Um, it could be anything from us, you know, a stock ticker, a Twitter feed, um, poll results, et cetera, financial data um, could all be fed in real time um, to feed the graphics on screen. So you could have, you know, sports scores populating a graph or something as they're coming in. Um, and I, I think the, the biggest thing is really just like the graphic fidelity and overall quality and photorealism that you can get now. It's it's approaching like almost impossible to tell what's real and what's virtual. Um, whereas even a few years ago, the hardware as well as the software just didn't quite have that kind of capabilities unless you were like a Hollywood studio with a render farm. Um, now there's tools out there that somebody who's very new to all of this can be creating photorealistic environments um, that really sell you know, to the final viewer. So what are some of the tools that are available for indie development versus professional level production? Um, I, I know Evan kind of mentioned the, the Vive, that's HTC's uh, virtual reality headset system. Um, I'd say that's like a, a great starting point um, for somebody who wants to get into virtual production. The, the camera tracking is really like the key to like virtual production at a, at a high level. Um, if you don't have camera tracking, it's always going to feel a little flat because your cameras never move and you're always going to be looking from fixed perspectives. Um, so the, the Vive system is great because it integrates directly into all the software, as we mentioned, or most of them, Unreal, Notch, Unity, Disguise. Um, there's also several apps for mobile phones um, that can turn your smartphone into a virtual camera. So you can kind of move around and be filming um, and you're not actually not actually filming anything real, but you're in your virtual space, you're taking a shot with whatever motions you want. Um, and I, I think those apps are very affordable. Unreal Remote 2 is one of them for iPhone and the um, Owl Studio Android uh, virtual, virtual cam, it's called, for Android, allows you to, um, to, to enable that capability and take advantage of the gyroscope on your phone. Um, and there's even apps now coming out that um, you kind of hold in a head mounted display and it can track the, your facial motion and you can get um, you can get facial mocap just with an iPhone and be driving a real virtual character's facial expressions in real time, um, which is pretty incredible if coming from a traditional content pipeline, 
spatial animation is a huge amount of work. And to be able to drive that in real time now with something as simple as an iPhone is is pretty incredible. Um, kind of to, to build on the mocap side, you can use the Vive VR systems actually to get like a budget friendly motion capture where you strap like a tracker to your hands and your feet and your headset and you can control a virtual character. Um, but of course, if you're getting into a more professional level, you would be using something like a motion capture suit or a motion capture volume with cameras placed all dozens of cameras placed all around you. Um, yeah, those those are uh, to name some brands in there. Um, Rococo is a is an inertial motion capture suit as well as Xsense. There's a couple of other that use volumetric capturing as well. Um, uh, when you when it comes to the camera tracking on that on that again on that high end of the budget, you're you're looking at Mosis, Stipe, Vcom, or Ncam. Um, they're all going to be your you know your more your top level or uh, higher end budgeted um, virtual production kits or camera tracking kits. Um, and they'll give you, a, each one of those will give you a variety of, of things that um, you can do with it, um, whether it's specifically camera tracking or talent tracking, um, augmented reality uh, pieces. It can be. The one thing I'll add is that there's not a lot of middle ground right now. There's kind of like the very cheap entry level options for camera tracking, like the Vive VR. And then there's the Stipe and the stuff that Evan just mentioned. And the, the price differences are night and day you know so there's unfortunately there's not really like a indie entry level or mid mid level option it's kind of like all or nothing you know um on and on that front you could uh the one place that is very scalable is actually your image capture so like i was mentioning before you could use a little hundred dollar logitech webcam that you grab off amazon uh all the way up to hundred thousand dollar cameras and currently right now i'm using a Sony A7 to actually capture this with a couple of Fresnels around me. But we've done shoots where with red cameras, you can go up to Ari's, uh, Alexis and LF's, really anything works. Uh, my biggest motto, anytime you're dealing with graphics or really anything for that matter, is garbage in, garbage out. So the better image capture you have, the better result that you can end up with. That's not saying you need that top of the line, high end Alexa mini LF to start off with, you could certainly start off with the lower end gear, get yourself used to it, get yourself working, try to develop some client base, develop some projects. And then as you're able to sell your skills, start to get bigger and bigger and bigger and rent the gear that you want. Nice. Okay. So um, I'm going to answer my last question I have written, but just a side note to um, our audience here. If you have any questions that you want to ask, just type them in our Q&A box and I will get to those. Um, but so to our panel, are there any uh, things that um, people should be aware of while venturing into virtual production? Like do you have any pieces of advice or just things that they should know? It's a lot of work. <laughs> Um, there's a lot to learn. It's a lot of fun, uh, but definitely a lot to learn. Um, very new. There's a very little, think, things are changing and happening pretty quickly. Um, yeah, that's that's actually a really good point. Is that the things that we could teach you today might be totally different. There might be totally like a bunch of new options six months from now, or even two months from now, when the next version of the next software comes out. Um, and what are ways people can stay up to date with it? Are there um, like forums I, uh, online or groups? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of great forums. Um, I know the three of us are on this uh, Facebook group called Unreal Engine Virtual Production Group. Um, it's run by a guy named Matt Workman who started a YouTube channel called Cinematographers Database. And he's been kind of examining cinematography behind the scenes for several years now. Um, it's been an incredibly valuable resource um, tons of good uh, information, tutorials, templates. Um, if you go down the Unreal Engine learning path, inevitably you're probably going to want to learn something called End Display, which is the output module that actually takes the graphics and outputs them to your LED wall or your projector, etc. cetera. Um, it's not super user-friendly. Um, it's definitely one of the most <laughs> painful parts of the process. So just prepare yourselves for that. I know there have been times in the in the studio where Keith and I have been sitting there looking over lines and lines and lines of code, trying to figure out why the hell can we not get an output on the screen right now? And it's just one little misspelling somewhere that often ends up being the culprit. But I, that's not to dissuade anybody from doing it. I am not a coder. I do not know how to code at all. Yeah. Maybe 50 lines of JavaScript in my entire life. Uh, but 
a lot of this stuff is still visual learning. It's really easy to figure out a lot of the stuff. So don't be afraid of it. Take whatever downtime you have and learn. Okay. Josh, the people want to know, what does your setup look like without digital enhancements? <laughs> what? I mean, I have like hair life so and other fast. things around me. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. That is um, catfishing virtual reality, the virtual production. <laughs> You've noticed I've slimmed myself a little bit here too. You know, just a little bit of angle. <laughs> No, that's really cool. That is really, really cool. Um, so another question we have is, what are some of your favorite projects that you've all worked on? Oh, um, in, I'll let you go first. Yeah, and in virtual production, I mean, we've really just been doing a lot of internal projects. Um, that's some of that stuff that we showed you, but out, outside, of, uh, um, outside of virtual production, um, Oh man, done a lot of a lot of fun projects. Uh, I used to be the uh, projectionist for Camp Bisco, um, so I mapped the roof of the Scranton Amphitheater. Um, this was several years ago. Um, that was a really fun project that I worked on. I used to also projection map a lot of buildings. Um, those are always fun. I'll chime in. One one fun one that Evan and I both worked on was designing content for a twelve projector theater on board the newest celebrity cruise ship. Um, the Celebrity Edge, which at the time I think was the most expensive boat ever built, um, which came with a came with a cruise. So nice. <laughs> spent 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 a lot of time nice to, on that boat. I was on that ship for fifty two days, so mm -hmm. it was by by day like thirty or so. It wasn't quite as nice. You kind of get a little uh, Stockholm syndrome. I, I only had to be there for six days, so it wasn't fifty two so days straight. Like you like were on there. Just um, we had to disembark and get back on the ship uh, during the, like the uh, it was a three week crossing from France to the U.S. and then there was many many sailings back and forth to small <laughs> Bahama areas. It was not fun, Bahamas. It was. <laughs> have you cruised since? No, I've not been. Back <laughs> no desire to cruise again. <laughs> not, not right now. Um, oh, actually, no, that's not true. I did do one groove cruise after that that um, that ship, which was a three day party on a ship. That was a that was a good much time. different from the work cruise. <laughs> Josh, what about you? What was what um, are some of your favorite projects you've worked on? Some of my favorite projects, like I honestly can't give specifics on, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, just NDAs and stuff like that. But those often are the ones with the biggest budgets, the most toys and the most challenges. Uh, one of which I remember involved, I think it was 10 tons of robots holding video screens that moved around the set and then mocking up a very large space to kind of transport people from New York City to the Caribbean when they walked in this building with lighting and video and scenic elements from this entire thing. Uh, other than that, some of my favorite projects have honestly been the past, my past in music festivals. I got my start as a technical director and assistant technical director in New York City. And when I was 20 years old, I was able to work with an incredible team as technical director of the first ever Governor's Ball Music Festival when it was actually on Governor's Island. And I remember uh, having a drink with one of my bosses at the time. I was 20, not 21. And I remember he puts a beer in my hand and goes, wait a second, how old are you? I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I was able to share beer with the bosses at the end of the show. But things like that, grow coming up in that environment uh, with just... And anytime I get to create a world, create a space for anywhere from 5,000 to 150,000 people to have the time of their lives, I'm happy. That's awesome. And are there some cameras that are easier to work with than others? And do you have any favorites? Yes. Uh, cameras are, you could go down the rabbit hole for your entire life and still not learn every single one. Uh, there's some things as simple as the little point and shoots that you could capture from. There's uh, mirrorless and stuff. I'm personally a Sony guy. I love my Sony a7 II. I've had it for a few years now. It's amazing. Uh, I use Canon glass personally and Rockinon glass. Uh, my favorite camera I've ever used on a set though has to be the Ari Alexa Mini and the Alexa Mini LF. That is something I will never be able to afford myself to own myself. Hopefully rent on some projects down the line. But in terms of putting somebody on camera, I find it the most flattering to skin tones, the easiest to light with, the best low light reception, and just the cleanest and highest grade image I've ever seen. Nice. Evan or Keith, do you have anything to add to the camera? Yeah, Josh is our main camera guy. Um, he, okay. 
takes the camera calls. Um, okay. Uh, I've always liked, you know, anything that I can use to point and shoot. Um, yep. <laughs> All right. Well, this is from Joel. Hey, Joel. Glad that you're here this evening. So where is this going to go in the future? Virtual sets via um, LED walls are placing most almost all sets god i hope not yeah I, I don't i don't think we'll see that i think that like the real the real beauty comes from mixing them together having physical pieces and digital pieces that um so that you really can't tell the difference there's always going to be a need for that traditional film there, there's also just a ton of shots that you don't have any need to create something that doesn't exist that you can't just easily shoot you know if you're shooting a sitcom in somebody's apartment you don't need to have a digital backdrop you just build a, a, you know, you just go to somebody's apartment and set up your camera. Um, you know, the LED wall stuff is really like really great for more CGI environments that just could never really exist or something that would just be so expensive to fly your whole team to the top of Mount Everest to shoot your like final battle scene or, you know, whatever. There's, there's definitely a ton of cost associated with setting up an LED wall too. So it's not always going to be cheaper. You know what I mean? Um, especially if your CGI elements are not super heavy, you're going to probably create more costs for yourself by trying to do it with virtual production if you don't really need it. But some, something you will see are some pretty incredible student films coming out in the next five to 10 years as film, uh, film schools start to integrate this technology and you just have like 10 kids, you know, working on their senior senior thesis uh, their senior thesis that is just going to be really incredible you're going to see a lot of really great work coming out of that in the next few years for sure and i've also even i'd love to shout out one of the people i see in the attendee list right now cole marcus uh awesome dude i had the pleasure of meeting in la last year uh we were doing disguise he was doing disguise training and i went to visit the office he actually was able to take a lot of the Unreal stuff, set up a few iPads and computer monitors on his desk and film like a Lego Mandalorian. And it looks really awesome. I, I mean, saw that. Stuff to start out like that is great. Just that you're sitting in your office at home in your living room, wherever you have a couple computer monitors around, play. Yeah, I, I saw one guy had set up uh, three iPads built into like a corner volume. And then he had like a, uh, I think it was like a Mario action figure you know, standing on it and it was like his tiny little LED backdrop and it looked great. <laughs> and he mapped it with disguise. <laughs> That's cool. Kelly wants to know, how do we think virtual production may be integrated with live events and settings as we return to them, knowing all we already do, knowing all we can already do now? And what are you planning for? Um, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, people are already starting to see the integration of augmented reality into live events. Um, people are starting to see that you can create these much more fantastical places and these fantastical kind of concepts for events. Um, if you look at uh, Tomorrowland as a as kind of a marker for that, or if you go back to um, the MTV Music Awards from last year, where the, each one of the live performances had an integration of some form of augmented reality. Um, I think a big part of the future that you're going to see is um, artists getting to be more creative um, and expressing expressing them the uh, their creative visions in a lot more dynamic ways. Um, uh, I think the augmented reality stuff is going to be really big for that. Where like Coachella, you have people whipping out their phones because when they look through the phone, they see like a special version of of what's happening on stage, basically with added graphics that's like only gonna expand. And I think kind of to get more to Kelly's question is, you know, you could have, let's say we're back in COVID's over, we're back to doing real festivals. How is this gonna integrate into a real festival beyond even the augmented reality is you could have screens behind the DJ that are giving a whole virtual backdrop um, more than more than just like, a you know, your traditional concert visuals, but creating more of like environmental visuals as these, kind of Hollywood techniques ex expand out into other sectors. 
Awesome. Well, that was, that was all of our questions. For shout, out, shout out, Kelly. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to everyone who asked questions. They were all wonderful questions. As always, I always learn so much during um, these webcasts because a lot of these are topics I'm not familiar with. So thank you to all three of our panelists for being here today and talking all about virtual production. This was super enlightening. And next time I watch the Weather Channel and I see the house with the car and the hurricane coming, I'm going to be like, I know how they did that. I learned all about that. Um, but so thank you so much. And if the three of you want to go around and just kind of say your name again, if you have a website or um, someplace on social media where people can find you, you can go ahead and promote yourself now. Yeah, we're uh, so our company is Digital to Physical Design. Um, uh, you can find us on Instagram uh, and the Facebooks and all of those things. But Keith is uh, uh, also works as an independent artist doing some pretty cool and uh, fantastical things. You can talk about that and, and Josh as well. Um, yeah, I, I've been doing live uh, DJing as well as creating content for festivals and other musical artists for a few years. Uh, my brand and uh, handle on Instagram is called Fractal Visions. Um, so you can find me on there as well as on the digital to physical design where I am the lead animator. And I'm uh, normally from the live events, concert touring, uh, live event world, but Redshift Designs is my company uh, as well as working th with these guys at digital to physical. Uh, find me a lot of festivals once they come back, hopefully soon, a lot of concert touring. If anybody is LA based, uh, we have two driving shows with Fits and the Tantrums coming up next month. Uh, so stay in your car, stay distant, stay safe, but let's have some form of events. Uh, would be awesome to have. Uh, and again, if anybody wants to go check out the Facebook page of Digital to Physical, they'll see uh, some of our demo reel content that we have created uh, since this pandemic has hit and since our time, in the virtual world is really focused. We're, we're posting new updates all the time as we're doing more R&D. We like to share what we're working on. Um, so yeah, tune in and get some get some looks behind the scenes is what we're doing. Great. Thank you guys so much. And as always, I'm Sarah Marins at sarahmarins.com. Have a great rest of your Wednesday and I will see you next time. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. You might be looking at shoot stop video and thinking, so how does this all work? Is this about a setting up the whole crew for me? B, just giving me options and having me handle it. Or C, something in between. Well, it's D, all of the above. To put it simply, we're here to help you in any way that we can to get the crew and talent you need for your next production. We believe that every level of video production can benefit from a well-maintained list of qualified crew members for every position. This goes for pre-pro, on set, and for post. Every project is different, so if you need a producer to help manage the decision-making process, then we can totally do that. If you're already a producer and want to build your own crew from scratch, then go for it. We're here to make your next production a success. And if you are crew or talent looking for producers that want you, then you've come to the right place. Sign up now and also leave a referral for any solid people that you know that are already on here. Thank you for considering ShootStop Video and happy shooting!